Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Welcome to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center for today's program, Can the P5-plus-1's Vienna Deal Prevent an Iranian Nuclear Breakout? Hudson Institute is a global security think tank dedicated to strong and engaged U.S. international leadership in partnership with our allies. Today's panel is just the latest in the long series of work that we have done on the Iranian nuclear program dating back numerous years. Uh, we're, we will have a panel shortly that uh, my colleague uh, Lee Smith will host with us, with uh, Will Toby of the Belfer Center at uh, Harvard, a noted expert on uh, nuclear disarmament uh, and nuclear proliferation issues, Mike Duran of Hudson Hillel Fratkin of Hudson Institute. Let me uh, simply note that uh, our colleagues, uh, Mike Duran, Hillel Fratkin, Lewis Libby, have written uh, a number of pieces that are just absolutely must-reads uh, on the issue of uh, the negotiations with Iran and also on the terms of the so-called uh, Iran deal. Hillel and uh, Scooter's piece that ran in the Wall Street Journal uh, last Tuesday outlined uh, the fact that the so-called uh, three-week wait period uh, that the uh, the three-week period before inspections uh, could occur of Iranian nuclear facilities actually looks more like about 68 days, if not longer, given the various options that uh, the Iranians uh, can take advantage of to stall. Our keynote speaker today needs absolutely no introduction. He's not simply a noted defense intellectual in his own right. He is a long-term friend of Hudson Institute, someone whom we knew long before he uh, entered Congress. He serves on both the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence. And uh, it was, uh, I guess, uh, about uh, 10 days ago that uh, a good friend of Hudson Institute, Congressman Mike Pompeo, who also serves on the House Intelligence Committee, addressed a Hudson Transatlantic Think Tank Conference on a Thursday afternoon, and he said that I need to get going because I'm leaving this afternoon for Vienna with uh, Senator Tom Cotton. Little did those of us in the room know that this would turn out to be an absolutely historic trip in which uh, the senator and the congressman would uncover the existence of side codicils between the IAEA and the government in Tehran that were not disclosed to the U.S. Congress. And so, Senator, we're always honored to have you with us, and all of us are deeply grateful for your service uh, to our country and to the cause of uh, preventing uh, an Iranian nuclear uh, breakout. Senator, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, Ken, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and thank you all for the very warm welcome. It's great to be back at Hudson. Um, the work of the Hudson uh, scholars and fellows has long formed the basis for important legislation and policy making in Washington. And on the topic that we're discussing today, Iran, uh, I can tell you that H the Hudson Institute has been a very valuable resource on Capitol Hill for me and my colleagues from the work that Lee Smith and Mike Duran have done. As Ken mentioned, the op-ed that Scooter Libby and Hillel Fradgan had written. Uh, I know that they have been widely read uh, on Capitol Hill. I have personally witnessed my colleagues in the Senate reading it and discussing it afterwards. So I and uh, they are very grateful for the work that Hudson has done. This is a very peculiar and momentous time in U.S. foreign policy. We're on day nine of a 60-day period in which the lone superpower on Earth will decide whether to accept a nuclear deal with a mortal an unrepentant enemy. 51 days to decide whether we abandon the framework of international sanctions on Iran that took over a decade to carefully construct. 51 days to decide whether we continue to isolate, challenge, and pressure the Ayatollahs of Iran or empower them in ways that will forever change the balance of power in the Middle East with grave implications for our allies and friends. 51 days to decide whether it's wise to join hands with the regime that for a generation has targeted and killed our troops, held our citizens hostage, and sought our nation's destruction. This is a weighty decision, but it's also not a hard one. The United States should reject this deal. No deal, whatever its details, should leave the Ayatollahs grinning. Iran is the worst state sponsor of terrorism in the world. It's led by an anti-American, anti-Semitic, jihadist regime that's destabilizing the Middle East 
and has the blood of hundreds of Americans on its hands. We do not share interests. We do not share values with this regime. Any agreement that advances our interests by necessity should compromise Iran's interests, doubly so since they are a third-rate power, far from the equal of the United States. The Ayatollahs shouldn't be happy with any deal. They should have felt compelled to accept a deal of our choosing, lest they face economic devastation and military destruction of their nuclear facilities. That Iran would welcome this agreement is both troubling and telling. Of course, it's not hard to understand why the Ayatollahs are grinning. The United States and the United Nations had a long-standing goal to halt Iran's nuclear program and deprive it of nuclear weapons capability. This agreement abandons that goal. In its place, the deal gives Iran nuclear weapons capability, laying out an R&D roadmap for it to become a nuclear threshold state in barely a decade. At the same time, it unfreezes over $100 billion in blocked assets to the regime, reintegrates Iran back into the global economy, and lifts embargoes on conventional arms and ballistic missile technologies. Today, the world has its hands full with an Iran weighed down by a faltering economy and a weak military, and which does not have a nuclear deterrent. But when this deal sunsets, <coughs> Iran will be nuclear capable, armed with ballistic missile delivery technology, and all protected by a stronger and modernized conventional military. And it will have a stronger, more resilient economy to finance even more terror abroad and ruthless oppression of its own citizens at home. And that's merely if Iran follows the terms of this deal. But I hate to break it to you, Iran isn't known for its scrupulous adherence to its international obligations any more than its little brother Syria upheld its recent commitment to completely turn over its chemical weapons arsenal. On the contrary, Iran has made clandestine advances in its nuclear program in the past. In fact, that supposed moderate, President Hassan Rouhani, himself boasted of his deceit as Iran's leading negotiator in 2003 and 2004, which allowed Iran to master a key stage in the uranium enrichment pro process. Unfortunately, this deal will provide Rouhani and gang ample opportunity for more duplicity and thus plenty of opportunity to obtain nuclear weapons capability well before this deal expires. As an initial matter, it appears Iran won't be required to disclose the past military dimensions of its nuclear program. Will Toby, the former deputy administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration and who's here with us today, has explained that knowing who in Iran conducted past weaponization work, where they did so, and with what equipment and materials is vital to an effective inspections program. Only by tracking those people, sites, and materials can inspectors ensure that Iran is not hiding other weaponization work. But incredibly, the deal barely mentions weaponization work. Instead, Iran's obligations are contained in secret side agreements concluded by the IAEA Secretariat in Iran, known to the Ayatollahs, but not to the American people. I had to personally travel to Vienna last weekend just to discover this shocking fact. The administration now admits that the side deals exist, but asserts that Congress cannot know their contents, despite the clear demands of US law and the unprecedented stakes. Nor can the administration dismiss the secret side deals as mere technical arrangements. Because weaponization lies at the heart of our dispute with Iran, that the administration would blindly accept secret side agreements on this core issue and ask the Congress and the American people to do the same is astounding, especially if published reports are true that Iran will be able to provide its own samples to the IAEA, much like an NFL player providing his own urine samples to Roger Goodell. The American people and their representatives should not and must not accept a deal with Iran and the Ayatollahs based on such blind faith. But past weaponization work isn't the only loophole in the verification scheme. As we all know, the administration abandoned our longstanding demand for any time, anywhere inspections. 
That's because the agreement permits at least 24 days, and as Scooter and Hillel have written, probably several times that, in which Iran may object to, request, to a request to inspect a suspected nuclear site. The administration contends that three weeks is an acceptable time frame because it's impossible to clean up traces of major nuclear research in that span. Perhaps that's true, perhaps it's not. But 24 days is certainly long enough for Iran to muddy the waters, creating doubt that it can use to manipulate pliant international opinion. Further, some nuclear work can, in fact, be hidden in 24 days. Ali Hainonen, the former deputy director of the IEEA, has explained that important nuclear work such as manufacturing uranium components for a nuclear weapon or testing weapon design can be done on a small scale that wouldn't be detectable after a 24-day cleanup. Nor should we ignore the risk the 24-day process poses to our and other Western intelligence gathering capabilities. During the period, the IEA must disclose its reasons to suspect an undeclared site, which could compromise intelligence sources and methods that could not only endanger Western sources, but also enable Iran to better hide their clandestine nuclear work going forward. But let's not abandon hope just yet. Assume the inspectors overcome all loopholes, delays, and international bureaucracy. They find incontrovertible proof that Iran has cheated on its obligations, and the P5 plus one agrees. What exactly are we going to do about it in that case? The only enforcement mechanism is so-called snapback sanctions. The administration makes much of this snapback provision as both the deterrent and punishment for Iran. But after a brief examination and a little practical knowledge of how politicians and diplomats think, it's clear that it's not Iran who will be deterred and punished by snapback sanctions. It'll be the United States. When snapback sanctions are the only enforcement mechanism, it's like the death penalty being the only sentence for all crimes, from jaywalking to murder. In the same way that a judge or jury would be unlikely to convict for most crimes in such a system, the United States and our partners will almost certainly refuse to cry foul when Iran, for instance, blocks an inspection, enriches slightly beyond a certain level, or fails to disconnect a few centrifuges. We can expect Iran to probe its freedom of action fully in these circumstances and gradually chip away at its restrictions with impunity. Besides, even if we do snap back sanctions, it won't claw back the signing bonus worth billions of dollars that Iran is about to get, nor will it apply to contracts concluded before the snap back, which were grandfathered under the deal. Plus, sanctions will snap back against a healthier, stronger economy and a better military. And worst, while we may have sanction snapback, Iran has nuclear snapback because they're entitled to shed their obligations under the deal should sanctions be snapped back. In other words, Iran can pocket all of the economic, political, and military benefits of this deal and still walk away with near impunity at a time of their choosing. These points are not disputable on the terms of the deal itself, which is why advocates for the deal try to avoid them. Instead, we hear lots of happy talk about numbers of centrifuges and enrichment levels. But let's not get lost in the weeds. A reduction of 22,000 to 6,000 centrifuges may indeed sound impressive. Yet most of these centrifuges won't be destroyed, merely disconnected or stored. And as former CIA Deputy Director Michael Morrell has noted, 6,000 centrifuges is just the number you'd want for a nuclear weapons program. Think about that for a moment. We're giving Iran just enough centrifuge capacity for the bomb, but far less than it would ever need for a peaceful nuclear weapons program. I'm sorry, peaceful nuclear power generation. And the 3.67% enrichment figure is likewise misleading. Now, the administration and proponents of the deal will highlight the huge gap, it would seem, between 3.67% and the 90% enrichment level needed for weapons-grade uranium. It does, in fact, sound very big and impressive. But Harvard professor Matt Bunn has explained, moving from raw uranium to 3.67% accounts for more than two-thirds of the work 
that must be done to get to weapons-grade uranium. The re remaining work is fairly modest, particularly once Iran is able to conduct or construct advanced centrifuges under this deal. And apart from all these misleading technical arguments, proponents of the deal often repair to what's almost an argument of despair. They lament that the current sanctions regime is crumbling, leaving this deal as the only viable alternative to war. If it's true the sanctions regime is crumbling, though, where was the evidence of it? In fact, it was the tightening of sanctions that brought Iran to the table. Any weakening of sanctions came about by lack of U.S. leadership and unnecessary concessions to Iran on the front end. After all, this administration actually fought Congress's efforts to impose sanctions on Iran's central bank. And we shouldn't forget that it was Canada and France and the United Kingdom, not the United States, that led first on central bank sanctions. If the administration believes sanctions are crumbling, then it's within our power, together with our allies, to rebuild them. Does anyone, after all, really think that foreign countries and companies would risk their economic ties with the U.S. economy to do business with Iran, whose economy is slightly larger than Maryland's? And that points to a better alternative to this deal. If Congress rejects the deal, the administration cannot simply throw up its hands. It is only through full spectrum pressure that the United States can move the Ayatollahs towards a deal that advances our interests and protects our national security and that of our allies. To that end, the President should work with Congress and our allies and with the United Nations after this deal is defeated to reimpose suspended sanctions and add new ones, isolate Iran on all fronts, support internal democratic dissent within Iran, and restore credibility to our military option. These are indeed momentous times. 51 days left. 51 days mark the difference between the preservation of the international non-proliferation consensus and our nuclearized Middle East. 51 days will determine whether we isolate or elevate Iran. And after 51 days, we'll know whether we will choose to oppose an Iranian nuclear capability or choose to legitimize it and all its attendant deals after an all too brief furlough. For the sake of the American people, of the world, and of future generations, I hope we, the United States Congress, and the American people choose wisely. Thank you all very much. Adam, is this okay? Can you hear? Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate you um, sticking around for our panel after the Senator's uh, very, very impressive speech, which I think laid out, uh, laid out all of the issues very clearly, uh, technical issues, um, political issues, and regional issues. And um, I think that what we'll do here is with our with a panel that we've assembled, including my two Hudson Institute colleagues, uh, Michael Duran and Halal Fratkin, as well as William Toby, I think that what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to burrow down a little farther in some of the details and pull some of these issues out. Um, and we're going to go probably a little longer than 1.30, and I'll see if we can get around to take some questions from the audience, which I'm very much looking forward to. But I, I really think the important thing right now is to, uh, is to unpack some of the issues that uh, Senator Cotton so kindly laid out for us um, in his keynote address here. And I'm going to ask um, my colleague Mike Duran to, uh, to kick it off. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Uh, 
the, the senator laid out um, uh, a depiction of a very lopsided deal uh, whereby uh, the Iranians get uh, permanent and uh, nearly irreversible concessions. Nothing is irreversible, but it would take an enormous effort to, to reverse them. Um, and uh, on, the, on our side, on the side of the United States and the P5 plus one, we just managed to buy a little time, uh, maybe a decade, uh, he said, but if they cheat, much, uh, much less. I think, I think it's worth asking why the administration accepted such a lopsided deal. And um, you, know, they, the, you heard last week in some of the hearings uh, that the, the negotiators, the American negotiators, were bamboozled. Um, uh, uh, there's a, there's a storyline story out there that the Iranian negotiators, are, they're, they're masterful. They play chess, we play checkers. Um, uh, and so on, uh, but I think that um, I think that misses the point. Um, the administration was not, uh, in my view, bamboozled um, at all. Uh, it uh, it chose this lopsided agreement with its eyes wide open, uh, and it it did that because um, it the president I think um, rejects the notion that we should coerce Iran. I think we should look at the deal not as an instrument of coercion, um, but as, uh, as an instrument of seduction. Uh, there's a, a belief out there, widespread in the, in the foreign policy community, that Iran is a natural ally of the United States, uh, that our, our efforts to isolate it are self-defeating, and that we just bring out its worst behavior when we do that that we actually share an enormous number of interests in common, and, and, and most important of all, fighting, uh, fighting ISIS. Um, and so what we need to do is lay the foundation for this partnership to, uh, to flower. And that, I believe, is what the, uh, the administration was doing. Now, in order to sell the deal, the, the, the administration pays lip service to uh, coercive techniques. But when you look, as the senator suggested, <coughs> at a lot of the coercive techniques that are, that are supposedly in the deal, uh, such as the snapback uh, provision um, uh, and, and other uh, uh, and other mechanisms, you see that they really kind of evap they kind of evaporate. The same with the uh, with the investigation of the uh, possible military dimensions. The IAEA has stipulated a number of areas for years has been asking uh, uh, the Iranians to come clean on a number of areas of military research, and the Iranians have stiffed the IAEA. Um, and if you look at the deal carefully, it looks as if the administration is forcing um, the Iranians to actually come clean before they can pocket this $150 billion um, signing bonus. And it looks that way because they have sequenced it with the, uh, uh, the IAEA goes to Tehran, asks questions, then writes its report, and then we get after that, uh, only after that report is written do we get implementation day when all of the benefits will accrue to the um, the Iranians. But if you read the language very carefully, you see that implementation day takes place regardless of what the Iranians actually say to the IAEA. So there's no conditionality, and it's sequenced so as to <coughs> suggest conditionality, but there's actually no conditionality uh, uh, at all. And I, I think that happens th throughout the, 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 the whole deal. Um, so the, what, what we've actually done here uh, by um, ceding so much leverage to the Iranians is we have created a situation where, um, where not only does it lay the foundation for a partnership, but it actually, the, the deal actually becomes a weight pulling us eternally in the direction of, of Iran. One of the things that the administration is trying to do now um, in order to get over the opposition in Congress is to claim that we're going to, that the deal has sort of parked the uh, nuclear problem off to one side. And now we're going to get down to the serious business of containing Iran in, uh, in the region. So yes, OK, perhaps it's true. Some of this $150 uh, billion dollars will go to Hezbollah and to other proxies of Iran. But don't worry, because now that we put the, 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 the nuclear deal off to the side, we can really start working with our allies of, of countering them. Uh, but then you look carefully at the, at the language of the deal, and you see, as the senator mentioned, the, uh, uh, the Iranians are saying, in the text of the deal itself, uh, if additional sanctions are placed on the Iranians, they'll blow up the deal, right? So uh, w w when, when push comes to shove, if the United States, for instance, begins training Syrian opposition against uh, Assad, the ally of, uh, uh, of Iran, 
will the Iranians will the Iranians sit back and do nothing, or will they threaten us? Will they use the will they use the nuclear deal as a threat against us in order to force us to respect their interests in the in other, in other parts of the region? Of course they will. They'll start blocking inspectors and so on, and they'll send a message to us that if they want, if they want, if we want continued uh, cooperation with them on the nuclear front, we better satisfy them in other parts of the region as well. Um, and that's, all, that's beside the fact that the, this administration anyway has made it very clear that it's not going to take any practical steps to counter Iran in Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon, or Yemen, where its, where its activities are most disturbing to our, uh, to our allies. So the president has an, uh, has an obviously expressed aversion to countering Iran in the region anyway. And, he's cre and he has signed a deal with Iran, which gives them additional leverage over us to ensure that I if we get the idea that we might want to do that, we'll think twice, uh, uh, twice about it. Thank you. Mike, thanks very much. Thanks for laying out the regional issue. And you and I have spoken about this uh, frequently, including here at Hudson, how this is a very important aspect of what we're seeing, what we have been seeing for the last several years. It's not just about a nuclear uh, agreement. It's about a host of other issues. Um, Halal, if I can ask you to, um, to follow Mike. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, there is, I, I guess one should begin by saying there are just a huge number of issues <laughs> that the deal, uh, or whatever it is, agreement, plan, and so forth, presents. But two are, it seems to me, are crucial and crucial and at the center of the debate. Um, one is the question of access. Uh, access which is supposed to provide verification and therefore to determine whether the Iran is living up to its agreement. And the other issue is enforcement, uh, or to put it more bluntly, punishment for any violation of the agreement. Um, on, the, uh, on the access, on the ver I want to talk about both of them today, uh, in, in both cases briefly, but beginning with the verification issue and the access issue. And this was referred to uh, in uh, Senator Cotton's very fine remarks and is, was the subject of, of a piece written by Scooter Livy and myself and published in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and it focused, it focused, and I think one should focus because that's where the debate is, on the so-called 24 days uh, provided for um, it to achieve access by the IEA to Iranian sites. Now, it should be stressed here, these are sites that are undeclared. They're not Natanz, they're not Forda. These are sites um, that are undeclared about which some suspicion has arisen. As uh, ostensibly, and the argument of the administration is, there will be 24 days in which this, this issue would be resolved and access would be provided. In the first place, uh, and as uh, our article argued, uh, 24 days isn't remotely close to the amount of time that would be spent in adjudicating this issue. Um, we estimated something like three months, but it's actually just an estimate. And the reason is very, in a way, simple, but concealed in the overall structure of the agreement. And that is, the 24 days is only one part of a three-part process um, needed to resolve uh, or ostensibly resolve issues con connected with uh, undeclared sites. It is preceded by a, um, a different part, another phase. It is followed by another phase. Um, the first phase is um, something the IAEA does all the time now uh, and has been doing all the time with, with Iran. It um, uh, presents to Iran and to any other country that it has suspicions about uh, uh, suggesting it has a suspicion, it has a question, a doubt about a site. This process, um, uh, as described in the uh, agreement, um, involves a back and forth between Iran and the IEA in which uh, Iran is supposed to provide explanations, the IEA is supposed to either accept those or request new ones. Uh, the problem with this is that there is absolutely no time limit specified in the agreement for this. Um, how long it would take is anyone's guess. 
Um, we do know that in the case of some sites that <laughs> IEA has asked about in the past 10 to 15 years, the time frame has been actually years. So um, it's impossible to know how long this would get stretched out. But probably what would happen in this context is that the IEA would finally lose its patience and then begin the 24-day process, which is essentially a, a request for access. Go through that. If that is unresolved, then there is a third process, which involves, um, on the presumption that Iran has not granted access um, or has not granted it on the terms that the IEA regards as reasonable, a dispute resolution process uh, goes into effect. And that can take, it, it looks like in the agreement that it might take 35 days. It could be capped at 35 days. It might actually stretch longer. So when you add the 24 to the 35, you get 60 plus whatever else happens. How, long, how much that would affect the question of uh, what could be discovered or not discovered after that time frame um, it depends upon what is there and what one's looking for. But the crucial, uh, another crucial issue here is that even at the end of that three-part process, access is not necessarily guaranteed. At the end of that process, um, there is what's called an advisory opinion, and Iran could decide that they are not taking that advice. So at the end of that, which is very much longer than the stated fr uh, time frame, you have nothing except um, the option of some party to the, to the process to go to the UN Security Council. And that is where, that's what that, this process could lead to unless Iran uh, acts in a way such as to give access and disclosure. And here I just want to end with uh, an observation about that last part of the process. And this was referred to by Senator Cotton in his remarks. That process involves what's called the snapback provisions. So in other words, punishing <coughs> Iran by putting sanctions back. Um, it does uh, provide for that to be a relatively easier process than going through what uh, people went through in order to put up the sanctions on in the first place. Um, there's only one problem. It provides for the, the snapback mechanism, and it provides for an out, an Iranian out, to the consequences of that snapback provision. That's because it also provides for, in the exact same paragraph, paragraph 37, if, if you uh, wanted uh, to look it up, that all contracts concluded prior to the reimposition of sanctions are uh, valid, all contracts. Um, this means that the reimposition of sanctions would not affect a whole variety of contracts that had already been concluded in operation. One could say, and this I think would be the respon natural <coughs> response, all right, you know, Iran would get in under the, the wire a few, few deals. But that would, um, they'd still um, be facing the loss of business and economic growth that would come from the deals afterwards. Um, unless they wrote contracts, which were very, very long term in the first place. Um, an administration defender would say, well, that's just really speculation, that's, you know, that's an extreme scenario, and so forth. Unfortunately, it isn't. Um, about two or three days ago, uh, that is to say the Iranians wouldn't do that or they won't think of doing that. Um, unfortunately, they already have. Um, a few days ago, the Minister of Industry, Trade, and Mines uh, announced that they were um, looking forward to deals in oil and gas and other, uh, other industries. And that they would, but before they would go in that, uh, uh, go there, they need to have a new model contract, unlike the contracts that they led before. The improvement of this new model contract uh, on the old, uh, there are a variety of improvements, but one of them, and it was explicitly stated, is 
These contracts will be for 20 to 25 years. So in other words, if a year, two years from now, we should find uh, Iran in violation of the agreement, and they should have um, written a whole variety of contracts of 20 or 25 years in duration, uh, and then we have a snapback, uh, its practical effect will be small to nothing. Uh, the, this agreement, in a few years' time, cannot be enforced by this mechanism. Hello, thanks. That's a terrific introduction on the, um, <clears throat> on the inspection and verification regime. Uh, Will, if you can, uh, if, if you can um, close off this round of our uh, discussion. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's a real pleasure to be at the Hudson Institute. It's the first time I've been here, uh, but I find myself among many old friends. Uh, Ken Weinstein and I first worked together 35 years ago, so it's very nice to be here. Um, like my colleagues, I'm going to dwell on a particular aspect of the agreement that I believe uh, to be central to the issues at hand. Um, it really gets to the core of what we're talking about. How far did Iran get toward a, creating a nuclear weapon? And has that progress ceased? In particular, I'm talking about the possible military dimensions described by the International Atomic Energy Agency. If Iran seeks to fulfill its nuclear weapons ambitions, it has <coughs> two paths available. One is um, breakout from declared facilities. And the bulk of the energy uh, in constructing the agreement was on this matter, this approach. So it, um, the negotiators spent a lot of time talking about what Iran wanted to talk about. What uh, enrichment activities will Iran continue to be permitted? How many centrifuges will Iran continue to have? How much uh, R&D work will Iran be able to pursue? All of this is at declared facilities. But most experts believe that if Iran were to uh, choose to realize its nuclear weapons ambitions, it would do so by sneak out from undeclared facilities. And there's ample evidence of an Iranian inclination to do so because its work at the Iraq heavy water reactor, the Natanz enrichment facility, Calais Electric, and the Fordo enrichment facility were all, all began as undeclared work. So the possible military dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program are 12 sets of activities that the International Atomic Energy Agency has identified as having been pursued by Iran. Um, these include, quote, military leadership of the program, clandestine nuclear material acquisition, work on, quote, nuclear components for an explosive device, unquote, detonator development, hydrodynamic experiments to test nuclear weapons designs without fissile material, integration into a missile delivery vehicle, work on a, quote, fusing, firing, <coughs> and fir fusing arming, and firing system. Uh, when I gave a talk at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory a year ago, I described some of these activities and asked the audience whether any of this work sounded familiar to them. Almost <laughs> all of them raised their hands. This is, this is the guts of a nuclear weapons development program. Um, so the IAEA has demanded on several occasions to have answers to the questions posed by this work. And on at least two occasions, Iran has agreed to conduct uh, a plan of action that would enable the resolution of these, these issues. Unfortunately, Iran has failed to follow those plans of action. The new uh, Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action, um, the, the Iran deal, provides for a series of steps. First of all, Iran is to make a declaration Second, uh, the IAEA can, get, uh, can give Iran questions. Then they're supposed to resolve any of those questions by meetings in Tehran. And it will culminate in a report to the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors in December, uh, on December 15th. So those steps are the 
submission on August 15th, the questions on September 15th, the report on uh, the conclusion of work by October 15th, and then the report on December 15th. Essentially what's happened here is the possible military dimensions issue has left, been left to uncertain and future resolution. This despite Secretary Kerry's insistence in April that it, quote, will be done. In other words, the, the uh, possible military dimensions issue would be settled before a final agreement. It of course raises the questions, <coughs> Why do we believe that Iran is more likely to uh, conclude a deal, uh, to resolve this issue now before, after conclusion of a deal than it was before? And what will the administration do if, in fact, Iran fails to resolve this issue? So as um, Senator Cotton noted, um, quoting me, <laughs> it's, um, it's important to get to this, the bottom of these issues for two reasons. First of all, in order to have a baseline uh, for verification, we need to know who did what, where, and when, or else we will be taking uh, what my Harvard colleague, Oli Henonen, formerly of the IAEA, said, a heck of a risk, because we won't know uh, what Iran has accomplished thus far, and therefore we will be less likely to be sure that it has ceased. And I would argue that this issue is important for a second reason. I believe that it gives you information about Iran's willingness to comply with the agreement. If they're not willing to answer such basic questions now, why on earth would we believe that they intend to comply with the agreement? Why would we believe this, that this represents a strategic by decision by Iran to abandon nuclear weapons ambitions in return for the benefits granted by the deal. Why wouldn't we believe this to be instead a simply a transactional matter where they uh, accept permanent um, relief from sanctions in return for temporary restrictions on the program? Will, thanks very much. Um, I, I, uh, what I what I'm hearing from all three panelists, starting with Mike, um, talking about one of the main issues is the regional agreement. Uh, moving on to Halal, who talked about the inspection and verification regime, <laughs> the enormous holes and flaws in that, and then Will talking about the issue of PMDs, uh, without which settling this issue, you can't benchmark <coughs> the regime, or you can't benchmark the program to know whether or not they are complying with the deal, whether they're really abiding by the deal. So my larger question for all three of you, and I'll start with you, Mike, do we really have a nuclear agreement at all? If it's so, first of all, with them, if it's so easy for them to escape this, to avoid this stuff, and if you're saying there's a larger play at stake here, yeah, do we have a nuclear agreement? Yeah, sure we have a nuclear agreement, but the value of it is we have placed ourselves in a, um, in a position where we are hostage to the goodwill of the Iranians. Uh, it's up to them to decide how successful this, uh, um, this agreement will be. And it's up to them to decide basically when the agreement is going to end. Um, I mean, the, the administration is saying that we get at least 10 years out of this. Of course, the stockpiles are, are restricted for 15 years, and there are other provisions that go on. Even um, even beyond that, so they can they can pre they can present it as an agreement that's going to last 15 or uh, years or longer. But there's a basic asymmetry built into it, um, whereby the the main uh, leverage that we have we give up in the front end, um, and uh, uh, and have no way of getting it back, or the, or the, say the the mechanisms for getting it back are extremely onerous on um, on us. Um, so we've kind of, if they are not interested in, in seeing this agreement through to the end, they need only wait about 18 months, two years, uh, to pocket the enormous benefits that they get up front. Um, and then they can start cheating. And if we, uh, if we even go the full route of snap back and, and, and try to regain our leverage, we still put them in a much, a much more favorable position at that point than they would have been had there been no agreement ever signed. <clears throat> Can I ask you, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to uh, elaborate briefly, this will come back on the essay that you, 
that you published with Mosaic on uh, the secret Iran deal. Why, uh, why is the administration, why is the president, there are perhaps people in the administration who don't understand what's going on in the same way, but why does the president perceive uh, the Islamic Republic to be uh, a desirable regional partner right now? Um, I think you can explain that. The, 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 well, first of all, the, the simple answer is we don't completely know because the president doesn't, doesn't completely admit that, that he sees it as a partner. The, the administration does, um, uh, there, I think there's a name for this rhetorical technique where you introduce an idea um, uh, and, then, and then dismiss it and pretend that you're not really introducing it. So, uh, you, know, you know, he'll say, as he said to David Rimnick in January of uh, 2014, he said, you know, you could imagine a situation where Iran will moderate and then we can become partners in reaching an equilibrium in the region and everything. And then he goes on to say, of course, I'm not dreaming about that, right? So that when you, when you, accuse, him, uh, uh, when you accuse him of using that as a plan, he can deny and say, no, I never said that. I was just kind of daydreaming. Um, and so ben Rhodes, ben Rhodes himself, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications, recently said, well, we, we're, not, we're not thinking about Iran as a partner, but we do think that an Iran with a nuclear deal will be much more moderate and cooperative than an Iran without one. Right? Again, he's like denying it, but he's saying it at the, at the same time. So they kind of seed the idea out there, and then there's surrogates in the media, uh, 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 prominent columnists, some allies, some uh, ministers in allied countries, they develop the idea more mm -hmm. formally. So it's hard to pin the, the president down on this. Personally, in, in looking at all this and thinking about it, my, my, my assumption is that the most important decision the president ever made about Iran and about the Middle East, he made before he ever set foot in the Oval Office. And that decision was to pull the United States back from the Middle East. And everything flows from that, I think, in a, a kind of, with a kind of path dependency. The minute you say I'm gonna, that we're overinvested, that's a phrase that the, uh, a term that the administration sometimes uses in private. We're overinvested in the Middle East. We need to pull back. The minute you say that, it automatically leads you to a position where you say we're not going to contain Iran in the, in, in the region, and that becomes very, that became very practical for the administration and. In 2010, when they had to answer the question about whether we leave forces, significant forces in Iraq or not, because one of the arguments for leaving significant numbers of forces in Iraq is to, as a bulwark against Iran, so that Iran can't take Iraq, turn Iraq into a satellite. Uh, so if you say, well, no, I'm not going to leave the forces there. I'm not going to contest Iraq against uh, uh, against Iran. Um, then you've 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 given up the game right there. And then then you have, but there you have the problem. Uh, I'm not going to contain Ir Iran in Iraq. I'm not going to contain them in Syria and so on. You have the problem sitting out there of the nuclear agreement, of the nuclear of the nuclear uh, 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 of the nuclear conflict. So you have to find a, in order to pull the United States back, you have to find a mechanism to put the nuclear conflict on ice. Mm. And that's the goal. That's the goal of this agreement. It's just it's just to push it off to one side. It's not to really solve it. It's to push it off to one side so the U.S. can pull back. Halal, is that why? Is that why you think I don't want to put words in your mouth and force the issue? Um, but is that why the inspection verification regime looks the way it does? Look, everyone says what we have to worry about is the Iranians cheating. The Iranians cheat. The Iranians lie. As we're seeing, as we're starting to see, one of the real issues is the administration uh, selling the deal not in an entirely accurate manner all the times. Is that what they're trying to do? They just want to move the nuclear issue aside. That's why the inspection and verification regime looks the way it does? Well, <clears throat> let's put it this way. I, I think, uh, and this, this partially uh, follows from what Mike said, and uh, although I, I, th I think I might disagree with him uh, a little bit, it, it follows, I think, from the view that the Iranians are really not dangerous. And, um, you know, uh, we wouldn't have to, you know, there's the phrase trust, uh, you know, ver but verify. Well, if you really trust, <laughs> you don't need that much verification. And um, it, I was struck by some of the uh, testimony that was given at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee last week. At one point, Senator Kerry was pressed, and uh, basically he said, "Well, you know, <coughs> we this is not a problem because the Ayatollah Khamenei has has a fatwa against <laughs> uh, nuclear weapons. And um, you know, all of you know all of this flows from 
their disinclination to create, uh, pursue a nuclear weapon. Well, if that's the case, what was all of this about? Right, if that's the case, why have and, you been negotiating with them over a nuclear... Right, so it, right. Um, either they came to acquire real trust in that fatwa, or they um, uh, believed it from the get-go, and uh, but needed to go through this in order to persuade, get to a point where, uh, I don't know, somehow the dynamics of trust would be established. And I think dynamics of trust is a, you know is a notion that that is all, often operated operating in uh, foreign policy um, in the pursuit of foreign policy when it talks often about trust building measures. I mean I never quite understood that because um, uh, you know the usually you have to build trust in in the context of conflicts that are so extreme a little bit a little trust building measure just doesn't seem like it's going to do it. But I think there is this notion, we, we really can trust them, um, or we'll be able to trust them. And, and this is where I, I'm, I have a slight disagreement with, with Michael about his interpretation of what the president said to Mr. Remnick. I think he said, I'm not just dreaming. I'm, uh, what I see in, in the Middle East is a group of people that are tearing themselves apart, but um, this is not in their interest. This is not in their interest as we would see their interest as uh, human beings, liberal Democrats, and so forth. And so it must not be in their interest. And the question is whether they, they'll, they can see that it isn't in their interest. And I think the president thinks that he has a deeper insight into what their interests are than they think he has and a deeper insight into what that could mean for us. I think that's um, often the case in the way in which the administration has talked about its, it, the, its superiority, uh, the, the superiority of the way in which it wants to go about things to other people. That it, it sees <coughs> things in history that other people don't see. Ben Rose said the other day that this agreement is about getting out of the rut of history. And there's a kind of confidence that, that Iran really, at the end of the day, doesn't mean what it keeps on saying, which is that it hates us as a matter of principle. Absolutely as a matter of principle. Um, again, Senator Kerry and the Iranians do talk about alleged grievances that, that were visited upon the Iranians, that uh, we were friends with the Shah, that we, uh, uh, they had the Iran-Iraq war. They forget, of course, that they actually came into office um, taking our, our people hostage and declared themselves from the beginning that they were hostile to us, not for any simply grievance, but because of the difference of principle in the regime. And I was struck by a bunch of things that um, the Supreme Leader has said in the last few weeks. Um, so was Secretary Kerry, who referred to them as disturbing, because they seem to go against the grain of this notion that we can find on the ground. But the one that struck me the most was that he said, actually, that he, they cannot give up being hostile to America because it would be equivalent to abandoning the Quran. Now, if that's, if that's what they really believe, then they can't abandon their, I mean, that would be, you know, that's to, to um, um, uh, it, it's to become an apostate, in other words, to, to deal with us on a friendly basis. Um, people might say, well, of course, and I think, and Kerry did say in an interview with Al Arabiya that, well, this is kind of the stuff that they say uh, and, we'll, and time will tell whether they really mean it. Um, but um, there's been a lot of time to tell whether they mean these things. And, and even so, even if he doesn't mean it, there must be a good reason for him saying it. It must be that there's a lot of people in Iran who really think that that's the case. Mm. Well, can I um, want to come back to the PMD issue, and uh, which seems to me it's not, it's not simply a technical issue. It's, uh, it sort of goes back to the 
the basic premise of the negotiations, right? I mean, the administration said, we're negotiating with you over a nuclear uh, weapons program that we know you have, and the Iranians are saying, no, we don't have a bomb. We probably even have a fatwa that says <laughs> we don't ever want a bomb. And right now, uh, I believe that we've collapsed on the PM PMD issue entirely. I think that was one of the, uh, I think that was one of the concerns about the secret codicils that um, Senator Cotton and Representative Pompeo found in, in Vienna. What does it mean, in short, that we've collapsed on the PMD issue, or the administration seems to have collapsed on the PMD issue? It is at the core of the negotiations. And for the administration to say that this is a secondary issue that can be settled essentially after the conclusion of the negotiations tells Iran that it's okay. You can lie to the IAEA and eventually we'll just give up trying to ask these, these difficult questions. Um, it's also important to understand, sometimes because of the acronym PMD, possible military dimensions, something that the IA, a term the IAEA coined, there are some people in headlines and even a letter signed by many House members have, have described this as past military <laughs> dimensions. Um, the the oh. two B, P's being interchangeable. It's far from the case that these are certainly past activities. The IAEA has said on repeated occasions that they believe that at least some of the activities uh, continued past 2003. And they've also said that they've amassed additional evidence since their initial report that tends to co corroborate their conclusions on the um, possible military dimensions. But I'd point out that even the administration says, has uh, put out authoritative statements that they believe weapons work is continuing as late as uh, August 29th, 2014. On that date, the State and Treasury Department sanctioned uh, several entities and individuals within Iran and described one of them, the Organization of Defensive Innovation and Research, which goes by the uh, Persian or the Farsi uh, uh, acronym SPND, as, as um, an entity that is, quote, is primarily responsible for research in the field of nuclear weapons development. Now, I'll tell you that the process by which sanctions are issued is not a casual one. These statements are gone over carefully by both intelligence analysts and legal uh, scholars to ensure that these are defensible. And the allegation laid by the State <coughs> Department in August of last year was that this weapons development work continues within Iran. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, when did that stop? What would a sneak out? Um, can I, I ask I, a quick yeah, question sure. that, as well? I, it, it was pointed out to me by a friend that um, whenever people talk about the breakout times in, in public discourse, um, they all reference uh, the time it would take to enrich the, the uranium. And that suggested to him that everyone, there's a sort of basic understanding that, in fact, the weaponization work has been already satisfactorily done. And that if that, so that if that's the case, or it needs to continue as it was continuing, you know, last summer, that the one reason why this issue gets, has been handled so cavalierly and un unfortunately so, is that it's assumed that it would only turn up what one already knows, which is that they have succeeded in weaponizing in the in mastering the technology for weaponization, both the bomb itself and the miniaturization and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think it's very hard to know exactly what Iran has accomplished, especially if they're unwilling uh, to be forthright about these things, and therefore it, that's why it's important to know in order to ensure that the effort has ceased. But I would typically the uranium enrichment or acquiring fissile material, whether it's highly enriched uranium or plutonium, is regarded as the long pole in the tent. That's the most difficult thing to do. 90% of the Manhattan Project's efforts went into uh, producing fissile material. And it's also important to know, I tend to be an empiricist on these questions, um, if you think, if you realize what happened in 1945, 
some of the uranium that went into the Hiroshima bomb was delivered as late as May, as May of 1945. And of course, that bomb was delivered in August of 1945. So the weapons work, sometimes people will describe, I've heard Secretary Kerry do this, uh, say, well, you know, it, it, we pushed them back to at least a year on the, on the fissile material breakout, but then they would have to weaponize it, and that's, that takes a while too. This work can occur concurrently, and so it can be a matter of, of months or even weeks after the final delivery of fissile material for a weapon to be produced. So we've described some of the issues with the actual, <clears throat> with the actual agreement, um, and as Senator Cotton uh, reminded us, there are 51 days now. Um, let's look at the end of those 51 days, and let's get as dark and as pessimistic as possible. <laughs> um, what happens? Can't we wait till then? <laughs> well, it'll be here soon enough. Um, Let's say that the let's say that the deal sails through, <coughs> sails through Congress. What does the world look like? What's Plan B, Mike? If you want to, if you want to start with that dark scenario, maybe it's not dark. Maybe things will be much better. Maybe someone will rescue us from, from uh, the mayhem. Well, I I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, as dark um, as it may seem. It's very dark indeed but not as dark as it may seem because um, I don't think that the sanctions regime collapses immediately. Um, I mean, let's, let's assume, we're assuming that, we're assuming that, um, uh, that the deal is going to go through, that Congress fails to, um, that fails, it may, it'll, Congress will vote a disapproval, um, the president will veto the disapproval, and then Congress will fail um, to override the veto. That's the darkest scenario yeah. there, and that's not, that's not, first of all, that's not um, certain. Uh, but if that were to happen, even then, uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that the European um, businesses rush to Iran. Some will, for sure, but I think uh, some of the larger economic concerns out there are going to be um, aware of the fact that uh, all of the Republican candidates have said that this deal won't stand. Um, and, and so if there's a... Uh, thanks in part uh, to Senator Cotton's letter. <laughs> so part, yeah, thanks in part to yeah. Senator Cotton's letter. So I mean, if, the, if there's a Republican victory in the, uh, in the next election, the, that, the, that president will, will set to work uh, um, on, on doing the deal. So the, I mean, the, the sanctions regime works on risk. Uh, and on raising the uh, on raising the, the 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 sense of risk that uh, the evaluation of risk that major economic concerns um, have about doing business with with Iran. So there's still going to be a, there's even with this even with this deal there's still going to be a lot of risk out there. Uh, uh, right. And so anybody who's risk averse is going to is going to hold back. Now, but but, but you, I was just, you've also said that that one of the issues one of the key issues isn't just the nuclear agreement. It's also regional realignment. How is it going to be possible? I mean, it's, it seems that right now this administration has worked to lock the United States and worked to lock Washington into different arrangements that are, that are uh, at odds with America's traditional regional policy regarding including Israel, uh, our Gulf Arab allies. What does that look like? Well, sure, yeah. The, I mean, the, the, as I mentioned, to sell the deal, they're saying we're going to push back against Iran. Um, and, and they talk about containing Iran in the region. But if you look at how they're defining containment and how our allies can find containment, it's two totally different pictures. The, um, the, the president's notion of containment is we're going to help um, the GCC countries, the Gulf Co Cooperation Council, on things like uh, interoperable missile defense, um, counterterrorism, and so forth. So we're going to strengthen them um, in terms of dealing with um, the enemy from within and their own... Um, and from a conventional attack from Iran, right? But a conventional attack from Iran is not what they fear. That's not the, um, uh, so he's like, the president is like, a, um, a, is like a, a, a doctor prescribing heart medicine to a cancer patient. They are, they are concerned about the subversive activities, primarily concerned about the, the subversive activities of Iran in Iraq, Syria, uh, um, uh, Lebanon, its support for Hamas against 
uh, against Israel and so on and so forth. And the administration has no good answer to that, uh, to that, to that problem, to the regional, and, and, the, and we should assume that this influx of $150 billion that's coming to the Iranians, $150 that's sitting in cash escrow accounts abroad, there's no reason to assume that the Iranians are simply going to repatriate all of that back into Iran. They can just start distributing it immediately uh, to their pals ar uh, around the region. Halal, 51 days. 51 days. Yeah. Well, um, I, I want to say uh, there, there's a lot of um, uncertainty at what happens after, if, it go, if, if it survives. Um, first of all, as uh, my colleague Scooter Livri has observed, this is actually, isn't actually an agreement. It's a plan. And as Mike has said, there's a lot of lack of conditionality in it. So various things may happen at, different, at a different pace. Um, it is alleged that by people who have examined the precise commitments that the Iran has made with respect to the dismantling of centrifuges and so on and so forth, that all of that, if they go ahead with it, would uh, if you add on the time from now, it would be about next, next summer by the time, or nine months from now, that, that they would have formally complied and that uh, at that point all of the um, uh, sanctions would be uh, uh, in the process of being lifted. The complication, it seems to me, uh, not, a complication is that Things may come off well before that because there are mo there's more than one party to this agreement. The Europeans are party to this agreement, and the EU sanctions may operate on a different timeline in a different way. So um, it's, I think Iran will not be uh, you know, particularly aggressive with respect to, um, uh, you know, to the agreement at, in the short term because they'll want to see the sanctions coming off and momentum developing. The question, the part of the question is, well, suppose we do turn it, uh, it is turned back, it may be at this point that sanctions just keep coming off because the EU can say, uh, the other parties to this, well, we agreed with Iran to do this and it's not contingent on whether you, you hold up your end of the, the bargain. So all of that now is a part of the uncertainty. The, the, the other part of it is that it seems to me that Iran has an interesting, some interesting calls between now and, the, and, and January 2017. That is to say, it, it is, should be tempted to take advantage of that time frame for the reason that Mike just described. Um, uh, it has found in the president uh, very little pushback. Or, or maybe no pushback, and um, and the, but his presidency is coming to an end, and it would be to borrow a phrase from um, um, uh, from his first chief of staff: terrible to waste an opportunity like that. Mm. So um, it it may be that most of the most of their energy will go into uh, advancing in more conventional ways their interests in the region. Mm in the short term, uh, probably, I would think, um, feeling free now to devote whatever resources it takes to consolidate the, uh, what's left of the Syrian regime. I think that probably is their, you know, their biggest uh, both problem and opportunity at the moment. And knowing that they have the agreement means they know they can spend the money. All right. Um, I am going to open it up in a second for, uh, for a few quick questions. Um, uh, and but before that, Will, I wanted to put you in a, in a strange spot. I wanted to ask you to answer uh, not just the worst case scenario, but the best case scenario as well. Let's say the deal <laughs> does not go through. Does not go through Congress. Uh, this administration, part of its pushback campaign, is to say no one has an alternative. Come up with a better alternative. Senator Cotton was talking about a a better deal. If I can ask you both, what a better deal looks like. And also, I am going to ask for your worst case scenario as well. Okay. Uh, with respect to, I think the administration is dead wrong when it claims that the choice is between this deal or war. Um, I think there are plenty of other scenarios that would be possible. Um, I think an amended deal, and Congress has certainly amended uh, arms control treaties in the past. This 
uh, is not an arms control treaty, and so it should be accorded less stature, I think, even than a treaty. Um, one could imagine a deal in which it had a longer duration, which I think would be important. Why is it exactly that Iran feels like it has to go back to the brink of a nuclear weapon in 10 or 15 years? If Secretary Kerry says it's unacceptable today for Iran to be two months away from a weapon, why is it all right in 10 or 15 years? And if Iran is truly interested in trading um, its nuclear weapons ambitions for a broader engagement, shouldn't it want to continue that engagement longer than a, right. in that period? Um, I think there are some holes that could be patched on the verification. We've talked about those. I think allowing the time for the IAEA to get to the bottom of the possible military dimensions would make for a better deal. So that, that would be the better, what a better deal might look like. Um, in terms of more optimistic scenarios, um, I'm not so much focused on the 51 days as, as, as I am on the roughly 141 days. Uh, that's the December 15th uh, deadline right. when yeah. we will know whether or not Iran has complied with the IAEA requests for information on the possible military dimensions. <coughs> and f frankly, the, the administration has put Congress in an interesting position. It's said, we'd like you to vote up or down on this deal uh, under the terms of a law that was passed by Congress and signed by the president, but we're not going to give you all the information, and we don't know what Iran has done on a key uh, feature of the deal. Congress could as easily say, well, um, we will uh, make our, our acceptance of the deal um, contingent on what happens in December uh -huh. um, as an amendment, or it could, if it could pass the law, say, uh, we're gonna give ourselves more time. We wanna mm -hmm. understand what the documents are, and we wanna know what Iran's response on PMDs are, and in December, we'll be happy to vote. Do you think that's at all uh, what's the, I mean, I'm the farthest thing a, from a Capitol Hill an analyst, <laughs> but I'm just thinking in terms of, uh, of uh, theoretical right. outcomes that would no, be consistent with U.S. I, I don't really have heard that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very one interesting one thing to note about, uh, and I agree, that that would, uh, he has put, or they have put Congress in a, in a bind, or you could say Congress put itself in a bind, is from, from their perspective, that's what's happened. And that was really, that was the, attitude of Senator Kerry at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He, he praised himself for having fought for uh, the right of Congress to review this agreement. Um, and complained, of course, that he, um, everyone else got, got to sign the deal, you know, simply without, on their own say so. The President of France, the Prime Minister of Britain, the President of Russia, the President of China, and so forth. It's only or Secretary Kerry, or President I Obama. I suspect that Senator Kerry would be displeased by Secretary Kerry's <laughs> deal. Um, all right, let's see if there are any, um, if you can just wait for, we have a microphone. <clears throat> Shoshana, if you would go first, if you can just, um, there's the microphone. And if you could identify yourself, too. Shoshana Bryan, Jewish Policy Center. How much credence do you put in reports of North Korean and Iranian and North Korean and Syrian nuclear cooperation. And if you're going to look at PDAs, don't you also have to look outside of indigenous Iranian stuff and see what they've been doing with other people? W Will, that's for, I, I assume that's. I don't no. actually know how much credence to put into those reports, but I think it's important that they be looked at. I think the evidence of Iranian cooperation with North Korea on, on missiles is um, quite strong. Um, and therefore, I, I would encourage the IAEA to be looking at these issues. Another question? Uh, Dan? Thanks. Dan Pollock from the Zionist Organization of America. I'm interested in Mike's thesis, and I just wanted you to take it a couple of more steps. So the administration is um, actually trying to, not doing what they're saying they're doing, what do they think would happen? They have the same intelligence information about possible Iranian cheating. <coughs> do they really believe that a year would go by and nothing new would come to light? They also know about Iran's tendency to be an unreasonable regional <laughs> player. How do they, what is the step two and three of this in the administration's supposed 
worldview about how something good can still come right. out of this, given the realities of Iran's behavior. Well, I, I actually agree with uh, Hillel when he said he disagreed. He thought that we, we, we might disagree. I actually don't I disagree with him. I was on a, when I said that it begins with the desire to pull back, I then think that all those other things that Hillel mentioned were, are 100% correct. The president believes, that when you, the minute you say, I'm going to pull back, then you say, well, what order am I going to put in place of the American-dominated order that exists? Um, and the only possibility, really, other than an American dominator order, is a, a kind of concert system. Uh, and so well, then you say, well, who are the candidates for a concert system? And, uh, uh, and Iran is a primary candidate because it's a uh, relatively stable, large, um, large country. And there's a, there's a theory of Iran out there, and it's actually, it's not, a, it's not an idiosyncratic Barack Obama vision of the world. It's actually very, very prevalent in the foreign policy world, but people don't like to um, adhere to the theory because it causes, it's, it's, politically, um, uh, it's politically toxic on Capitol Hill. But the theory is that the Iranians are pragmatic actors, um, that the revolutionary fervor has been long gone from the, the regime. Um, the, the regime knows that it's not particularly popular at home. Uh, and um, therefore, all it wants to do is to hang on to power. That the that hunger for surviving uh, it, it turns it into a, uh, a pragmatic actor that we can do that we can do business with. There's an assumption um, in all of this too that it is uh, as hostile as we are to the Islamic State. I, I happen not to believe that one bit. That's I'm sorry, what the regime is hostile. That the to regime that? is hostile to the, the to the Islamic State, and that. And so there's a, there's a notion that our number one interest in the region is, is, to, uh, is to defeat ISIS. Iran wants to defeat ISIS. Iran can be our pragmatic partner in tamping down the worst pathologies of the, uh, of the Middle East. This, has been, this is an old vision of Iran. It's been out there a long time. And, it's, and by the way, it's prevalent on the Republican side as well as on the, the Democratic side. Um, you, back during the Iraq war, there was a notion that uh, uh, Iran doesn't want all of this uh, instability on its border, so it's really our partner. Uh, it's really our partner in stabilizing uh, in stabilizing Iraq. This kind of this kind of thinking, um, and it of course completely discounts everything that they ever say. Um, but behind the scenes, the, the Syrians and the Iranians are masters at this kind of whispering. Um, you know, I'm sure that if we, we, we could snicker a lot at the, at, the, at the conversation that would go on around the table between Secretary Kerry and, and Foreign Minister Zarif. I'm totally making this up, right? But, uh, but not, on the basis of, <laughs> not on the basis of no experience. I worked in the Bush White House, and I've seen the whispering from the Syrians and the Iranians that, oh, we can really help you in solving all those problems. If we could just, if, if we could just get this, if you could just come toward us, on this on this nuclear problem, then you'll you'll be shocked at uh, the way we'll be able to cooperate on on other things, and we want to believe it. It's because it uh, it offers a, a completely conflict-free path forward. Yeah. Uh, um, let's get one more question here. Sorry, uh, the gentleman over here, the glasses and the beard. If you would identify yourself. Mohammed Yunus from the Gallup Organization. I just want to get the panel's reaction to a crazy idea. Um, that perhaps the reason we need this deal with Iran now is because containment actually has become impossible because of the huge windfall they essentially got from the Iraq war. From what? From the what? Iraq war in 2003. So essentially, a, b a major part of being able to contain uh, Iran, of course, was Saddam and the stability of Iraq. That's gone. Um, another argument is the reason there's ISIS is because I Iran has basically increased its leverage dramatically in Iraq, and what they've chosen to do with that leverage has created an environment where ISIS, or a movement like ISIS, can take form. So well, I think, should I we? Think, I, think that, I think that's true. So, what, but, but, so let's move to your question. About so the question is, is, is containment of Iran now impossible, and therefore this deal is actually the best that we can get? Or is that too pessimistic? Halal, you want to start with that? Uh, containment is not impossible. I'm not even sure that, well, we used to, uh, I'm old enough to, uh, recall that the alternatives were not were co containment and rollback. So uh, the the question is, you know, what cost one wants to bear to accomplish those things, and and how you know what assets one has um, to work with. I would. It seems to me that uh, I, it's, it's unlikely. It seems to me that this administration is going to change its policy. 
The question for the next administration is, will it um, think that it's been left a mess that he has, it has to fix? And what it will think is the, the way about, of going about it. It will face a situation that the costs have become very high for certain <coughs> actions that if had they been taken earlier would have um, perhaps contained Iran. So that has to be taken into account as well. I think um, just guessing one option will be to say, well, what is left of um, assets uh, and allies and friends in the, in the region? And, um, and we'll look presumably to the Gulf, to Egypt, to Jordan, Israel, maybe Turkey, but, uh, and say, what, what can we do with this? Um, because as Mike said, the, the, the way it looks now is the, you know, the big guy on the block, absent us, is Iran. And so no one else has the force to stand up to them. I'm, I'm going to do something I rarely do, and, and, or I've never done before, but I'm going to have the last word answering your question. I think it's possible, <laughs> and then we're going to adjourn. Um, but here is my answer to the idea that the United States is incapable of containing Iran. I think if you see it from a certain perspective, I think what you would need to assume is that the United States is totally bereft of assets and will and the ability to do it. But I would also say it's interesting, Mike and I have been talking about this, uh, only partly tongue-in-cheek. I think it's possible to believe that this is the JCPOA is one of the greatest diplomatic masterstrokes of all time. What you have to assume to get there, though, is to assume that the Obama administration sat down without any leverage at all. It said, by refusing to hit Bashar al-Assad in September 2013, it said, by the way, military force is off the table. Once it started talking, talking about the crumbling of the sanctions regime, it said, and by the way, the sanctions regime is over as well. At that point, for the administration to sit down with the Iranians and even keep them at the table, Astonishing. <laughs> Astonishing. Once you say we have no leverage and to get anything out of them at all, it really is genius. I think, I think it's impossible. I think it's possible to actually understand it that way. Uh, I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been a very interesting afternoon. Thanks very much. <laughs>